So I guess we can get started. So uh, just welcome to Basecamp 7, session three. Uh, today is all about Starknet. Um, last session was all about Cairo, in this case, just vanilla Cairo. So today we're going to see how to actually use your skills that you gain solving the Starglings into building smart contracts for a Starknet. Although if you solve the whole thing, the whole Starglings, you probably got to exercises to also include a Starknet. So you might have some experience there as well. Uh, but I'm just going to let Pierre explain more because Pierre, as I mentioned in session one, he's one member of the community. He was also a Basecamp participant in the past, so now he's coming back uh, as a trainer. So over to you, Pierre. The floor is yours. I'm just going to be here in the background just taking a look at any Q&A. Uh, remember that there's a link to Slido for questions you can use. But if you feel more comfortable with the chat, we can also monitor that as well. So up to you. So over to you, Pierre. Hello, everybody. So yes, I'm Pierre. So very recent in the ecosystem this year, but learning a lot from people, base camps and stuff like this. So it's pleasure today to try to go with you uh, uh, to see how Starnet works and how we can uh, write smart contracts. So to dive in. Uh, so at the end today, we are in station three. Uh, you are almost at the at the half of the of the base camp. And today we will start uh, writing code, which will actually be on the blockchain. So this start to be interesting so just to recap uh, the presentation will not be long but the idea is what are we dealing with so in starknet we write smart contract in Cairo. Cairo is a programming language very similar to rust and then it's compiled to sierra which is a safe representation uh, of Cairo, which is then compiled to chasm which is for Cairo assembly and this is what will be on chain okay so it's it's and this is what the the Cairo vm is able to interpret so it, just keep it in mind we it's all usually abstracted by the two but it's interesting to keep in mind that this this uh, path of compilations so i just want to start with a, a very important point on starknet um starknet contracts we have a dichotomy here because we have two ways of in, uh, working with contract we have a contract class a contract class can be seen as a regular object-oriented programming, like it's the code which is associated to the contract. It contains the ABI, which is what are the functions that are accessible from outside of our contract, and it is identified by, by, the, by a class hash. Okay, so this is a contract class. When we write a smart contract, we are actually writing a class, okay, which is the code that actually contains the logic that we want to express. A class is declared on Starknet, so the, the vocabulary here is important, is declared. And then the class hash changes any time you modify the code. This is a very important point because when you write contracts, you have to expect this class hash to change. And this is how we identify the code that is related to a class, okay? Then we have a contract instance. A contract instance is uh, linked to a storage. Uh, associated class hash which is which code we actually run and the contract address okay so a contract instance is something that we deploy okay and first we have to declare the class which is the code that we want to run okay so if we make a, a graphical representation we can see a stagnate like okay i am writing a class which is my care code a contract and then i i need to declare this class like this startnet I, I upload the code, I, we can see like this, we upload the code on Starknet, which is declaring a class. And then the class we can instantiate, which is deploying several instances. So it means all the instances here will run exactly the same code, but each instance has its own address, which means its own storage, okay? So we can have lots of cases and, and, and lots of people are writing contracts. So anytime a new contract is declared, it's a new class. And then we can instantiate it. OK, and lots of time we, we hear about blockchain and state. W what is a Starknet state? Well, simply put, uh, a Starknet state is just when a block is produced, we just take how many classes we have declared, which classes we have declared, and we take all the instances state, the storage of the instance and, and every information about the instance. And this is a Starknet state. state OK, so it's, it's at the end simple to understand that we just take a snapshot of this information. So how can we interact with that state? So in Starknet, we have two ways. We can make reads, which is named calls, which is completely free because we are only reading information uh, from the blockchain. And then we can write something. 
and when we write something is when we use the invoke transactions okay and transactions means we have to make some computations and we have to incentive the node so we have to pay gas okay so to recap in stocknet we have only three uh, transaction types we have the declaring declare transaction so we, which is in blue it's related to the class so here we don't think about addresses and storage no it's just i take a code i compile it and i upload it on stocknet this is the declare then we have the invoke the invoke is when I have an instance, I can invoke making writes on this contract. This will um, modify the state, the storage of the contract. So this is on the instance. And we have deploy account, which is a, a special case that we will not see today, but it's also related to the instance. Okay. So this is to give you a brief overview. So if we take again Stocknet, how Stocknet is, 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 is organized, we have at the top left the mempool. So we as external users we send transactions the transactions arrive in the mempool and the sequencer in the case of katana we have seen madara or the sequencer in israel that is running starknet now is receiving these transactions validating them and then it will run the transaction against the starknet state that we see like taking the contracts taking the code associated to the class and then running the code in the context of the instance because we have seen that the instance has the storage and then the block is produced the prover will generate the proof and then it will be settled on ethereum okay uh, david don't uh, so now we will see a, a little bit of contract anatomy but if there is already questions uh, we can make a brief pause here yeah, there's a question from Vincent. Uh, how do state commitments being compiled? I saw the docs that it is class hash commitment and contract commitment. Do we need to have two different types of, two different trees for each class hash and contract commitment? As is, mm. uh, maybe you have to read the question in the chat. I'm just trying to read as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so the, the commitment, so I, I, perhaps I don't have all the details, but the idea is when you have a, when you have a block that is created, each transaction will modify uh, the the instance uh, of, of a contract. Okay, so it will modify the storage, for instance. But we can also have uh, transactions that declare that we are the class. So it means the state itself contains uh, effectively all the register registers of change uh, for each of those, like which classes we have and which instances we have, and what is the state of this of this one. But I will not be able to answer exactly how the Miracle tree or the tree is exactly organized in the state diff, but uh, I can definitely uh, find the documentation about this, perhaps if there is in Stocknet. But uh, but yeah, so if it's exactly how the trees are organized, I will don't have these details right now in memory. What what I can say for sure is that when you declare a, a smart contract, that class hash is it gets included as part of the data availability sent to layer one. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely, it's registered in the in the state diff. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. But exactly how uh, the trees are organized, I will not be able to answer right now. But yeah, it's definitely registered. Uh, OK, so if we move on, we will just see a very basics of contract anatomy. And with this, you will be able to understand almost any uh, Kero contract. OK, so a contract, we have to keep in mind, it's a Kero module. OK, a Kero module is declared with a mode keyword. And we have to put the the the, the macro attributes stocknet contract, okay? And the very basics is can be an empty module, but we always have to do the storage, and the storage uh, can be empty, but it has to be declared, okay? So this is a very minimal contract. This compiles and this is a functional contract, okay? Then uh, what we can have is a constructor. So as we have seen we can write the code which is writing the contract class then we can declare it and once it's declared which means the code is on stocknet we can deploy it and when we deploy there is a constructor that is called and it's called only once okay so it means you can use a constructor to pass initial values to your contract and you are sure that these values are uh, this function the constructor is only called once which is very interesting when you have to set up and for security uh, if you don't have to initialize anything, you can just remove the constructor from your code and it will still work because you don't have any value to initialize. Okay, so in the code here, we have a contract, a storage with a value, a constructor, and when I will deploy this contract, I have to pass this initial value and then this code will be run once. Okay, 
Uh, then we have the events. A contract, uh, it's not a mandatory, but you can have events. Events are usually used when you want to your contract to output data that you don't want to store uh, that's in the storage, which is very costly. So events uh, can seem weird at the first glance, but at the end it's organized like this. You always have an enumeration where you put all your event structure and name that you want to, to declare. Uh, the name has to match, I think, in this version yet. So you, you, you still have a match between my event one, my event one. And then I have a structure. Just be careful to don't forget the, the derive here, the, the attributes. And then I can put any fields I want in the structure, okay? The little one key here is used to index and to filter more efficiently your data when you are acquiring uh, the events on the node. So you can ignore this if you want, but I strongly recommend to think about your keys because it's very then easy when you want to get data and try to index this data. So these are the events. Two questions the, in the chat for yes. you, uh, Pierre. Uh, Satyam asked, does the contract code becomes part of the standard storage when we declare it? And second question, do we pay gas fees when, when declaring contracts? So I will start with the second one. Yes, we do pay fees because declaring a class includes a, a state modification, which is we register a new class. So we pay fees, uh, fees to declare. And the contract is part of the startnet state. So just about storage, the, the term storage, we usually refer it to a, a contract, okay? So a contract, when it's deployed, it has its own storage at its address, and we can store data. The stocknet state can be seen uh, as, as a, a big box storage, yes. And, and if we see it like this, yes. The, the class you declare is included in this big box where stocknet will be able to say, oh, this class hash exists and I have the code related to it. So yes. Yeah, questions mm -hmm. about gas fees, more questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Does transmitting events also incurring gas fees? If so, how, how is the gas cost determined? The gas cost of events is very low because it's just about the computation that uh, it needs to be done to, to, to emit the events, but it's very low. Uh, to make the, cost, the gas cost determination, there is some tooling that Robert will show you the next week that is coming better and better in, in gas estimation. And also Katana will help you see gas uh, determination. But emitting an event, you have to consider it very cheap uh, compared to writing in the storage. Uh, Vincent also asks, is the gas fees based on the network congestion on L1? So for now, the, um, the I would say no for now, but we will have in the few months a new release of StockNet where the gas fee, the fees will be completely reorganized, how the fees will be will be managed. And here, I think, yes, you will have a, a, a correlation directly between L1 and L2. But nowadays, I will not be able to tell you exactly if yes or no, but I think not. Or no, I think no. So in the new release, you will have market fees, which means you will be able to, to tip the sequencer if you want more priority, and the fees will be clearly separated. What do we pay for L1 settlement? What do we pay for L2 execution? And what do we want to tip to the sequencer? There's an excellent talk from Starkware's, um, Starkware Summit that happens um, maybe yeah. a few weeks ago. Uh, from the professor Noam Nissen talking about exactly how these fees are calculated in all the different variables that goes into it. I think it's worth a look. I'm going to share the link of the YouTube video on the chat. That's actually a nice reference. <laughs> okay, so uh, to follow, then we have functions. So here is the, the most important part that our contract, we want to be able to interact with this contract. So basically to expose a function, we can have this way, which is pretty simple. What we have here, we have an external macro, so attribute. So this will uh, expose the function uh, when the, the contract is, is, is deployed on StartNet. And here you can see there is two nomenclature, two, two way of writing it. I have a self with an at here, which is a snapshot. A snapshot is just um, a, a read-only reference on, your, on a variable. So it means when you accept a snapshot with this symbol of at here, you know that you cannot modify this one, okay? And then we have a write value here, which is taking a ref self, which is a reference on, on a variable that you can modify, okay? So it means here we have two functions. What is important here is external v0 is required to expose a function. Um, this can be seems weird, but 
as Cairo is uh, growing and changing, this attribute is here for backward compatibility when Cairo is evolved, and also it here for you know declaring uh, that the function can be exposed. So we will perhaps have like different version in the future, but for now, just taking account that you have to put external B0 and it will be able to externalize your function. Um, then we have two kinds of functions. We have a read-only function, which usually called a view, that take a snapshot, as I said before. So any function you write with a snapshot will be free, okay? Because it can be called, because we know it will not modify the state, okay? And then we have write functions that are named external, and those ones take a reference, and as we take a reference, we might modify something, and then it means it puts gas uh, to call these functions that will alterate the, alterate the state. But now we can see interfaces because having function is fine, but it's better when we can know what the contract is doing. So interface interfaces are here for that. So here, if you can see, I just take back the two functions and I just put it on a trait in Cairo, and I just use the stock interface uh, attribute. So what does this mean? When Cairo will see this, Cairo will generate uh, structures for you to interact with the contracts, but it will also help you when you will write the functions to be sure that you don't forget any arguments, and you will see why in, in just a few minutes. So interfaces ensure that any contract is implemented exactly as the interface, interface that is uh, uh, mentioned here. It completely standardized how the contracts are called, and you will see why in a few minutes with the dispatchers. And it's strongly recommended to use this because it's very easier for people to integrate with the app or any tools or other contract uh, to interact with the contract. Okay. So how do we implement an interface? So as you can see here, we have the two functions we had before. I didn't modify anything, but I just wrapped it in implement block. Okay, and you can see I have the external v0 at the top and implement block. I say, okay, for the implementation of the name I give in my contract implements, I want to implement in my contract, which was the name of the interface. Okay, and here I have to pass contract state every time. And here the difference is that if I change new value, for instance, and I change the tip or I just make a copy paste and I forget the, the type, it will complain at the compile time, which is very nice because you are sure that if you don't implement the interface correctly, the compiler will not let you uh, going forward. So very interesting to use uh, this approach instead of having like functions free like this. There is cases where you just want a function and you just don't have to bother with an interface, but as StackNet will evolve, the interfaces will be part of standards. So I strongly recommend you to, to use interfaces guys. And the last one is how do we call contracts? So the dispatchers are some structures that Cairo will generate for you just to call easily a contract. So let's, let's go in the code here. We have a trait, which is an interface. And the interface have two functions, get data, which is a view, set data, which is an external. And as you can see here, I just import eData dispatcher straight and eData dispatchers. And I, I didn't write this, these two structures. They are they are written, written by Cairo automatically using the StockNet interface. And here I can easily call a contract because the interface already defines which are the arguments, the outputs, so Cairo can easily, you know, serialize the data. So it means here, just having the dispatcher. And then I can just call the function with the exact same name of the interface. So dispatchers are automatically generating from interfaces. Another reason to use interfaces. Using a dispatcher like the normal one, you use the storage of the contract you will call. So it means here, and we will see this in the coding session, but it means if you use dispatcher, just expect that when you call the contract, you are using the storage of the contract you call. But if you use the library dispatcher, it's like, oh, I just want to call this function of this contract, but I want to use my storage. I don't want to use his storage. So it's just like, I use it as a library. This is why it's called like this, because I just want to run the code without actually modifying the state of the target contract. And we're good. So we can make a few questions, and then we can just start coding. Let's see, there's a couple of questions that were unanswered, trying to find. Uh, one question was about 
uh, how is uh, stored as how is contract state synthesized? There is no visible implementation of contract state. Mm, contract state, no. Well, you can go in the compiler and, <laughs> and actually see what it does. But contract state is just a way that um, it's just a, a way that you can pass pass the the state of your contract as as a variable. So it means it represents your 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 contract state with the values, the storage, etc. So it means just see it for now as a placeholder that every time you pass it to a function then you know that you have all the states so if i just go back here uh, if i just go back here for instance yeah when we when we implement the interface the interface here you see that this is self so it means the contract itself is considered as a contract state okay so it means this is how we can pass data and and this is important because Cairo soon we'll have components and the components will be used to reuse logic without without having to paste copy paste everything because for now carol we if we want to reuse the logic we cannot modify the logic we take a for instance open zipline standard we can use it but if we want to modify it we have to externalize stuff and rewrite stuff with components the contract state will be able to be passed very easily just to be sure we can reuse smaller uh, logic part including the state Okay, for now we cannot reuse the state. We have to pass it directly in functions and we, we can start working with it, but components will be nice for them. Yeah, a, a lot of the code, like this code for the dispatcher from the interface, that actually gets generated at compile time. That's part of the meta programming that you, you have with attributes and stuff like that. So that's why you don't find it directly in the code. It gets created at compile time. Stuart also asks, is contract state a reserved name? Mm, good question. We can see it in a few minutes and try to declare it. That's a good question. We can try, but I would say yes, but because it's already a struct uh, that is declared, so we can try. But I think yes. Gonzalo asks, what types can a contract receive as an input? Is there any size limit? So um, in Cairo, when you have inputs, um, when you you interact with the contract, everything is serialized. So it means. If I have, for instance, uh, uh, an array of files as input, when I will call the function, I will have to pass the array serialized, and we will. I think we will have time to just check it out a bit in the in the session. So it means any type you can declare in Cairo can be an input or an output of your function. It has to be serializable. So it means if you implement your custom type, just be sure you derive the serial day. We will make an example, I think. Uh, just to be sure that it's serializable. Any Cairo type serializable can be input or output. And the size limits, I would say, um, I'm not sure if there is a hard limit, but uh, I know that if you put too much stuff, I think it can it can cause trouble. So you can make some tests. I didn't actually, but it can be interesting. It can be interesting to test. Thank you. Uh, Falilet also asks, I noticed that you use the dispatcher for a view function. Can it also be used for a write function? Definitely. Uh, that's a good question. Actually, um, dispatchers can be reused for any function you define in an interface. Uh, Vincent asks, what is the difference between a view function and an external function? So as we've seen, a view function is something that will not modify anything. So when you have a view function, as you can see on the screen, read value is a view function because it takes a snapshot of the contract state. It means Caro will the compiler will not let you modify the state inside this view function. Okay, and uh, a, a next normal is a function with the second one right value take a reference mutable reference of the of the contract. It means it can modify the state. So this is a the main difference between those two. So uh, when we write something in the state which is modifying the storage of a contract, we have to pay gas, and we if we only read something we don't have to pay gas. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, people in the chat, if we missed your question, feel free to post it again on the, on the chat. Yep, no yep. more questions for now. OK. So what we will do today, um, I will just share my entire screen just to be sure you can see. And I will try to go, to go with you in a very organic manner uh, how I will code uh, uh, the honorable contract. And like this, we will be able to see how, how to code it. So. The contract we will try to rewrite today is an honorable contract, which is here. Uh, David already uh, made some changes on it, but we will just take it and re-implement it in a uh, uh, like 
Caro also new, new, new versions that David already implemented here. So what I want to show you first is just to be sure that everybody is, um, is on stage. So yes, I, I will not have Visual Studio. So if there is Visual Studio questions, I think uh, we will have uh, some uh, David or Robert, I think, uh, answers. So I'm sorry, I will not be able to help on, on Visual Studio issues. So normally you have um, already installed uh, Cairo with, or with your, you have SCARD. So if you make SCARD version, you should have the 0 0.7.0. Uh, David, the size is okay. Oh, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, looks good. So fine. Okay. So you should have SCARB 0.7.0 and Cairo 2.2.0, okay? So the first thing we, we will do is, so in my case, I will go in TMP and I will go SCARB, new, uh, I think it's new, and then we will make demo project. So this creates a demo package. And by default, we have a SCARB toyml file and we have a source file, which contain the library, okay? So let's check what we have here. So the manifest of SCARB is a file where we define what exactly we want uh, as dependencies, et cetera, to build our project. So we will just see in a minute. And if we go in the library, we already have some uh, stuff that we don't want for now, okay? So uh, what we have seen before, we have seen that StockNet contract, we have to put the attributes, and then we have to declare a module, okay? The module will be a uh, contract one, and then, as we have seen, a storage has to have always a, a storage, even if it's empty, okay? So storage, strict storage, and here I have my storage, okay? So if I now try to compile this, so let's go in TMP demo. So here, scope version, I verify my version, I'm fine. Uh, if you have to change a version, remember ISDF is very easy. You can have ISDF, okay. local. Can you get the yes. font size of that terminal a little bit? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you. So if you if you have to change the version with ISDF, it's very easy. You can have ISDF, local score, and here you can put any version you want. So it's interesting to, to manage a version. So here, if I try to build, I should have something building, but I don't have a lot of stuff actually uh, ready here. So the first thing we want, actually I'm pretty, but it compiles without the stocknet. That's interesting, perhaps because I don't use it. So what we want, we want a stocknet dependency. So stocknet dependency, as you have seen in, in, in SCARB, it's 2.2.0. So I will just put, okay, SCARB, I just want to use a version of stocknet, which is at least 2.2.0. And then I want to be sure that when I compile, I compile something for a uh, stocknet contract. So target is stocknet contract, okay? And here we want to be sure we generate the Sierra code uh, for now. And with Robert, you will see that all the details of this file uh, the next week, okay? And I think with this, we can be done and we can compile. So we will just verify that everything is fine. If I put something here, which is not expected by the compiler, it should complain. So I recommend you as a general software development, just don't write too much code before compiling. Just try to compile the most often that you can. So um, now we have our contract is here, it's defined and we have the basis. So now what do we want to do? We want to write a no enabled contract. So actually let's call it enable contract okay and enable contract if we go in the definition of what is enable contract and i like going sometimes you know to the specifications so enable contract is something that a contract that will expose uh, an owner function which is a view so this is something that we can call just to know who is uh, the current owner and so we have a function. font size of that one please yeah, sure sure Okay, good. So, so we have a, a view which is owner, which is, okay, I, I have to have a function just to call without paying something, just to know who is the current owner. And I need a function to transfer ownership, just to say, oh, okay, I, I want to change uh, the owner. But everything must be controlled by who is the actual owner, okay? So to do so, we will start first to say, okay, we have to store somewhere who is the owner. So the best way to store something is using the storage, okay? So the storage will have a contract address, all right? So if I try to compile, you can see that Cairo sometimes is very verbose. Like it will explain lots of things, but sometimes there is just only one error in your contract. 
So this is why you should compile very frequently. So here it's saying that I cannot find a StarkNet contract. So here, this is why we have to use uh, to import the types inside our uh, our scope. So here, if I import the StarkNet address from the StarkNet module, I should be able to compile, okay? So the usage sometimes is a bit painful but when you when you don't know from where it can come from. So for this, I really recommend you to check Kero book and, and StarkNet book and also the, the compiler code if you want to go deeper. So, um, so here we have something. We know that we have a storage and we have a value that is in the storage. So now what we want to do is we want to initialize this value. And as we have seen, what is the best way to initialize a value once? It's using a constructor. So a constructor, we have seen that it must be called constructor. So function constructor. And then I have to pass some arguments. So the first argument is always a reference, a mutable reference uh, ref uh, self on the contract state. OK? Like this, I am able to modify stuff. And then we want to accept a value to say, OK, when someone will deploy, they will have to pass the first value. So we will put initial owner. Well, let's take it, yeah, just to don't have the same name. Initial owner, and this must be also a contract address. So you have seen then someone ask about the inputs. You have seen that I am putting an input which is of type, type contract address. Contract address is a type that is serializable, so I can definitely use it as an input for my function. Okay. So here I can have my constructor, and then what I want to do is when the constructor is called, I want to write this value in the storage. So to write in the storage, you always use self to refer to the contract itself. Then you use the storage name value, which in my case is owner, which is this one, owner. And then I want to write it. And I want to write it with a simple, a simple value, which is initial owner. OK? So here, I should have my call compiling with a very basic constructor that says, OK, when I am called, I will put this initial owner value inside the owner storage. OK. Uh, we can make a little pause here. David, if there's an important question, if not, I just move uh, forward. I've uh, been trying to answer the question just myself and I interrupt you. So, OK, 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 fine. Uh, maybe, maybe just one question. Uh, Durham asks, can I store objects in array on a storage? OK, so how things are stored in Cairo in StartNet? When you want to store something, you have to see that you have your contract address, OK? So every contract that you deploy has its own address. You have to see the storage as like a shell uh, with a lot of, 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 of places. And then you can put value inside it, OK? So it means, once again, something to be stored must implement a special, special trait, which is store, which define exactly how the type is stored inside the storage. So any type that has the store trait derived can be stored in the storage. So all the basic types are uh, already storable. But for instance, if you have a struct with a lots of fields and some of the fields are not basic types, you have to implement this. So it, it's a bit more advanced, I would say, but just taking account that everything that you can implement the trait can be stored. So here, I can imagine to have like a, a custom value, which is uh, my struct, for instance. There is no problem with that. but it will just depend how the struct is uh, implemented. And if it's only basic types, it will work. If it's not, you will have to implement the store, uh, the store trait. Oscar is saying that it's a little too fast to code along. Uh, oh, but I think that because okay. there's a lot of ground to cover. And mm -hmm. you're going to have the recording as well. But up to you, Pierre. Yeah. You know I, the, the timing. I, I will try. OK, I, I can try to go a bit less fast. I just want to be sure we can see stuff. And as David said, as you have the video, you will be able to repass it. But I will definitely try to go a bit slower uh, just to be sure you're able to do it at the same time also. But, but that's a good point. But the idea is trying to to see a lot of, not a lot, but sufficient thing that like this, you will be able to alone write a contract and deploy it. OK, but yeah, I, I will try to go a bit slower. OK, so now we have a contract. We know that we have a storage, and we know that we can construct it. OK, so for the testing part, um, today we will test the contract just making the calls when it will be deployed, because Robert will cover how you can test a contract without deploying it. But 
to be sure that we don't uh, see things of the next week. Uh, today, we don't put test for this reason, okay? But usually, you're very recommended to developing using tests. Like this, you are sure that you're not breaking everything when you are uh, doing changes. So now we have a contract, an owner, and we have a constructor that initializes the value. So that's fine. But now, what do we want to do is we want to be sure that this contract, which is unable, we will want to reserve some functions only called by the actual owner, OK? And to do this, we have to make sure that we can have functions that we can verify the owner before the call is done. So let's try to make a function. And I will start to make the good practice. I will make an interface, OK? An interface to say, OK, this contract will, will expose some, some, some functions, OK? So let's say in data just to say so we will have e data and e data will be an interface where contracts can get data okay so sorry for the names but I don't so uh, so here so here's the subtility is that you have to pass the refer the template the generic type so as we have seen in the in the presentation uh, if I just go in the presentation two seconds as we have seen here mm, sorry here. So here, when we implement an interface, we, we don't give contract state here. Why? Because the interface is something generic. The trait is something generic. You say, OK, it takes a generic type T, doesn't matter what for now. And then it just implement the way we implement it in the interface. And then when we implement the interface, you see that we have to use construct, contract state. OK, so if you prefer just for you for, you know, remembering it you can put t contract state here if you want uh, in my case i just don't put it because it's a bit too long but the idea is here is just a placeholder okay for the generic type you don't have to put contract state here okay so i will let t for now but the idea is here so when i get data we will say data data will be a, a felt okay and then we will have a set data and this function as we have seen that to modify we have to have a reference the reference means it's not a snapshot, a snapshot being something that is read-only. And then we will have a new value here, which will also be a felt, and we don't return anything, OK? So this is a, the behavior we will try to implement, OK? And what we will try to do is the get data will be able to make to be done by everybody, but the set data will be done only by the owner, for instance, OK? So now let's implement the, 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 the interface with this. So external implementation, you can choose a name, and then you put the contract, OK? So it means, in my case, I will have external v0, just to be sure it's exposed. Then I will implement um, onable uh, e-data. So onable data implementation. In Tero, we have to name every implementation. So this is why it can uh, looks a bit easier at the first time, but it's very interesting when you are debugging just to know exactly which is the interface that is causing some trouble. So just remember, implement the name you choose for the interface, that must the implementation that must be unique. And then we put the interface that we want to implement and we have this time to use contract state because we are in the in the in the in the in the contract itself. Okay, so here we have this, and then you can just take the two function signature we have in the traits, and here we can just implement them. So I have the functions, I have the functions here, and then I will implement uh, the logic. Okay, so here if we want to use some data, we will have to store the data. So let's have something that is called data, which is a felt. Okay. So remember, if you want to have data that are persistent, you have to write it in the storage. So and any storage, I will put a comment here, any variable of the storage that is not initialized will have default value. And in the case of a felt, it will be 0. OK, so I don't have to initialize it if I don't want to. I just will be fine with the, with the default value. So here I go back in the implementation and say, OK, when someone just want the data, I will just have to return the data. So here I will just modify contract states because it's the actual type contract states. OK, so which is a type that we have here at the, in the parameter here. So here I will say, OK, 
self dot and I want to read the value, so data dot read. And in Cairo, if you don't put the semicolon, it means it returns the actual data. So it means here the function is expecting a felt. So we will see that if I put this semicolon, it will not return every anything. So the compiler will complain. If I put the don't put it, I will return the result of read. And as data is a felt, it will return a felt. Okay. And in the case of set data, I want to write the value. So for now, we will just write the value. So data writes, and I will write the new value. Okay. In this case, I will put the semicolon here because I don't want uh, to return anything. So let's try to compile because it's some code that and we didn't compile. So let's try to compile. And here we can see that we have a lot of errors here. So that's interesting because what what did I miss? Okay. And always try to go to the first error and then is oh okay uh, i cannot find a trace which is i data oh well, that makes sense because where is data located i data is located here and as we have seen a contract is a module and the module has its own uh, scope so it means everything i write here will not be visible in my module if i don't import it so it means here i have to explicitly say okay use and in Cairo, we can refer to the module, which is just above. So in my case, I am, I have my contract. And here I am above, which is considered as a super module, which is just, just above my module. So here I can use super, which is just above, and then the data. OK? So it means here I am importing something that is outside of my module. But this is not from the Stockman module, for instance. OK? So let's try to compile again. And now it works. So I just want to show you something. Also, you have another way to import stuff. So if I go back to the scrub.toml, you see that my package is named demo, OK? So it means I can also refer to that package as its name. So it means if I do use demo e data, it should compile too, OK? So usually, you want to use super if you know that your module is always located at the same location based on, on what you want to import. But if you don't know exactly how it will evolve, I recommend to use the name of the package. Like this, you are sure that it's very easy to change. And if you make new models, it will be able, you will be able to make, oh, it's demo, then it's module two, and then et cetera, et cetera. OK, so important detail, important detail. So here, here, so now we have a contract that compiles. And let's actually put a, a, a semicolon here, as a, a, we talked before. So if I put a semicolon here, and I try to compile, I will have something complaining about, oh, you know what? I am expecting a felt, but you are not returning anything. The, the, two, the two parentheses is a unit type, which is nothing, OK? Um, so, but not nothing like the options, you know, that we have none in options. It's like, it's a type in itself, but it's like, no, no data, no data. So here, if I want to be able to run, I have to remove it. OK, so is there any question, David, that we? we have to answer or I can follow with the private mm. trade. We're good, we're good. OK, so now what we want to do is we want to make some functions internally of our contracts just to be sure that we can check some stuff and we don't have to rewrite a lot of code. So we can make a function like this. I can make a function like check owner, for instance, or owner only. I think we call it data, which is not. So we can have a function like this. And these functions can have a self, which is I don't want to modify anything. This is a view. But I didn't put the external. So it means this function will not be able to be called from the outside of the contract. So I can do something like this. And this, I can return a Boolean, for instance, that says, OK, it's the owner or it's not the owner. Or I can make a function that if it's not the owner, I want to exit or revert. The, the, the exact term is revert. So it means reverting is like this is an error that we don't want to continue. We don't want the call to be made, and we don't want the state to be changed. So when you revert something, it means you just want to stop the execution. OK, you, you, you just don't want the transaction to be to be to be fulfilled completely. OK, and how do we revert in in in, in Cairo? There is several times, but the, 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 the easiest way is asserting something. So it means when you assert something that is not true, the contract execution will revert, which means you are sure that nothing will be changed to your contract. Okay, so for instance, uh, let's make a very simple assertion. 
uh, bad equality, for instance. So oh, let, let's say let's say invalid order. Okay. So it means here I can make my assert, and if the asset pass, it's fine. If it doesn't pass, it will crash. So let's just try to build these words, and then let's try to do something like this. Here I can make uh, owner only, and then I don't have to pass any any parameters. Okay, it's the function that is here. So if I try to compile this, I have an error of argument. Yes, there is a self, which is the contract. So important detail. Some of you are, might be familiar with Rust. In Rust, the self parameter is implicit, which means you don't have to pass it every time you want to call a function from an implemented struct. But in Caro, it's explicit. So every time you want to pass the actual contract state, you have to pass it uh, manually, okay? And in that case, I will just try like this and you will see there will be another error. And this error is saying, oh, you know what? I am expecting a snapshot but you are giving me the type itself so i have to fix that and to fix that i just have to pass a snapshot okay and this is due to the fact that this function here is expecting a snapshot because this function is saying oh you know what you can call me i will not modify the state so we have to pass it a snapshot just to be sure that it will not modify the state okay and here i should have something compiled okay but compiled so we can do something like this. So let's try, actually. Um, yeah, I cannot try for now because I have to deploy, but I, I, we, will, we will see it in, in a few minutes. But this is nice for, for private functions. You can consider that a function without external is private. But there is a better way to organize the code, which is there is a trait that says, oh, this is a trait that actually makes the functions private, and they can warn you if you don't use them correctly. So. I will just get back to the David contracts here. And as you can see here, there is this piece of code I will take and I will just try to explain to you because I don't know it's enough to write it by memory. So let's take this. So here we have, uh, let's, let's remove this for now, just focus on this one. So we have an implementation. We have to give the name of the implementation. So here you can choose everything you want, but in that case it's private methods. And then we have private method threads, which is something that uh, is existing in Cairo. And this is saying, okay, everything that is inside will be definitely considered as private and the compiler can make extra checks on that. So perhaps David, you used it a bit more uh, than me. So perhaps you have some comments on that. Oh, it's fine. No, no, it's good. It's good. Okay. Okay, okay. So, so yes, I just want to check it out that um, when we use that, okay. So here, what, what, what the interesting things, uh, the generate trait is that you agree with me that when I want to generate e data interface, I have to define the trait, okay? It means I cannot use implementation of iData if I don't define the trait before. But sometimes you just don't want to bother to declare the trait and you just want to implement the trait based on what you, you are written, writing, okay? So it means here, this is why generate trait is here. Generate trait is saying, okay, you don't want to write the trait, so it means if not, I have to do something like this, private method traits, and then I have to say, oh, this trait, I have to have one function, which is this one. But I don't want to write it because it's just, I want to put a bunch of, a bunch of functions here, and I don't want to bother writing it because it's private and nobody will use this interface you know what i mean so here we can remove this and using generate trait it will do exactly this for us okay so what i have here generate trait will generate exactly this at the compile time okay so this is why we have generate trait here so here we have a function which is only owner and this one is taking a snapshot which is what we have here and then we have an interesting point is let color equal get color address. Get color address is a special function of Starknet, which is okay. When you call it in your contract, it will give you exactly what contract is calling your contract. Okay, because remember in Starknet we have um, account abstractions, which means it's not your wallet which is calling something. Is you send a transaction to your account contract, and your account contract is calling. The contract you are targeting okay so get color address usually re will return the address of the account contract which is the address that you can think about your wallet but just be aware of this difference okay 
So what's the difference with what we had before? You see that I call the function without any prefix. I just call the function and I pass self directly to the function. But in the case of implementation, I am importing the function to the contract. So see the difference here. I will call it like private like this. And here we have owner. So it means this one, I have to call it like this. But now as I have a function that is defined in the contract, I can make something like this owner only okay and this one as i am calling on the self then i will call this one okay so it's better to use this private method trace just like this you, you you're sure that you're including this on your contract uh, self but uh, as always there is sometimes use case where you perhaps don't want it or you want to go fast or you just want to don't bother with this you have to do this, but it means you also have to pass the states in an explicit manner. Okay, both both will work, but we we can recommend just to go with the private method trace. So let's try to remove this, remove this one, and now let's try to compile, and it should not compile. Why? Because I have something that is not existing, which is get color address, and get color address is from the Starknet uh, one. So you have two ways to do this. Or you can do something like this, directly giving the module, and then you pass the um, and then you pass the name of the function, or you can go at the top of your file of your module, and you can do something like this, which is open a curly bracket, and I want to put all the imports of this module, and here I will put get contract get color address. Okay, so both are fine. Usually in Rust, when you call a function you call it with the module prefix to it. But sometimes you see also code when you import a function. So just feel free to stick to one of the of the way you want to do this and then uh, just stick to it. So, but both are completely valid way to, to call a function, okay? So here we should be better, but there is another problem, which is, okay, only owner is not found on the contract state, okay? So if we go back in the David code, we should have somewhere about the private methods where is it where is it where is it mm -mm -mm. actually david uh -huh. can you increase the font size of that please yes yeah yes. I, I i'm just curious about you know here you call the self but i'm yeah. just curious of why why in my case What's the error? Not found on demo. Oh, because it's called, it's called only owner, not owner only. Yeah, because I made a mistake. Thank you for the review. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so yeah, compile often. <laughs> Just to be sure you don't have this kind of mistake. <laughs> okay, so now basically what we have is we have a contract. This contract have two functions exposed, which are get data and set data. And the save data is supposed to be called only by the owner uh, uh, when we call the same. So here, as you see, we make, okay, get the caller address and be sure the caller is exactly the same as the owner we have in the storage, which is this one. And this owner is written at the initialization of the contract. When we deploy it, we will pass an argument to the constructor and this will initialize this value, okay? So yes, I think we are fine for the first part, which we were implementing the basics of the contracts. Uh, what do you think, David, what you said that making a pose and then just get back with Katana starkly and trying to deploy it? Yes, yes, a good time to make a pause. It's, uh, it's noon, so I think this time, there's a lot to cover, right? So maybe instead of 10 minutes, I have five minutes. Sure, there. fine. And so we have fine, enough fine, time. Fine. So mm -hmm. five minute break. Um, just have a you know some coffee, some washroom break, and we'll be back <laughs> yeah. with the next section. Yes, see you in a minute. Bye. Okay, five minutes have elapsed here, so we can mm -hmm. continue. Okay, let's go. So now we have the basics. I will just go a bit faster just to implement the honorable trait because at the end that I, I made simple functions to, to show examples, but now let's have the honorable trait itself. Like this, we will be in the same theme of the of the of the of the of the repo. So let's take an interface, which is the interface that we have for honorable traits. 
So you, you can prefix trait actually if you want. I like hear that doesn't have it, but uh, uh, same thing. It's like uh, you can choose a, a way to write it and then you, you, you can stick to it. So the idea here is we have seen that we have a transfer ownership and a, a owner function, which is just uh, give me the owner of the, of, the, of the contract. And in that case, we only use contract addresses for new owner and for the one we return. So now if I try to compare this one, um, you will see that it will not compile again. Also with the same logic that contract address, and you see that sometimes Gary is something giving you lots of output for a little detail. So go to the top, contract address is not found. So here we import it, but we import it in our module. Remember that any file in Cairo is a module. So here I am declaring a module, but here I am in, an, in another module. So here, if I want to use it, I also have to have it declared. So I have to use startnet contract address, okay? So just remember, any module has its own scope and just be sure that you import stuff correctly because if not, the compiler will complain a lot. So here we have something like this and now we are able to compile correctly. So now we will implement this one. So same logic, we have to go, uh, so let's take the functions. So we have to go in our contracts. Once again, external v0, then we make the implementation, enable uh, trait implement, let's say, and then off, uh, how did you call it? I think it's like just enable traits. Okay, so enable trait. Enable traits, and then contract stakes. Always contracted here. And then once again, I take my two methods. I just take them here. I put the body, and then I just change this just to be sure it's contract stakes. So did, did, did you decrease the font size? And it, it looks smaller. Oh, just... sorry. Sorry, sorry, perhaps. Sorry, it was a mistake. Right. Sorry. So, so yes, we have the ownership, uh, new owner, etc. So here, what we want to do is we want to say, okay, first we have to be sure that it's only the owner itself that can hold it, okay? And once we make sure of it, we have to remember the value. So the previous owner is the owner that we read in the storage, okay? So remember, self name of the variable on the storage. And once we have it read, read then uh, we want to update the the owner. So we just keep the previous owner to emit an event uh, just to be sure that we can notify. And then I can make owner.write new owner, okay? So here you can make different tests. You can check if it's the same owner just to be sure you don't, you don't make a swap for nothing uh, and pay gas for nothing or stuff like this. But the idea is very, very basic here. So let's go back to events because here what we want to do is we want to emit an event just to be sure that we know something happened. Okay, so if we remember the structure of events, uh, once again, I think I don't have it in mind totally, but let's take a look here and like this. So an event is always two things. So let's first focus on the event enumeration. You have an event enumeration, you have to give a name and the name must be the same of the structure type, okay? And then you have to use your own structs that also derive events. So don't forget the attributes here. And here you see there is two. Just be sure you don't forget the little event here for the enumeration. And here, have you seen that there is two keys? So it means the two fields will be indexed and used as a key so you can use it to query the, the event. So here is totally up to you. You can remove a key if you want. You can add some data. You can put everything you want here. And once again, you can put any data type that is serializable. So it means all basic data types are serializable. So you can put them, you can put an array, you can put everything you want. It will just be outputted in data. And remember, events are very cheap compared to storage. So sometimes you just want to emit an event and you want, you want to use an indexer just to understand and see what happened on your contract. But let's take this exact example. So then we have to emit it, okay? So to emit it, when we implement the event, we have to uh, actually saying which kind of events we want to emit. So the structure is self.emit, which is a, a, a function already implemented with the attributes we are seeing. So, so this is not ourselves that we have to we have to do it. So I will just verify that. Yes, we have the same. So here you have two ways I think of doing it. Uh, you can use the enum, or you can also use directly the name of the of the structure i think so let's 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 give it a try 
which is a bit uh, less code to write. So here I am saying, okay, I want to emit an event which is of this struct. And here I have a prev honor and I have a new honor. In Cairo, it's like in Rust. If your field, your local variable, has exactly the same name of a variable of the struct. So if I go back here, you see that I have a prev honor and a new honor. So if I have exactly the same name for my variables, Cairo is able to take this, say, oh, okay, this is, I have a, a variable with the same name, so I will directly inject the value inside it, okay? So I can do this, or if you have different values, you can put something like this, I don't know, depending on your name, but remember that the shorthand is very, very handy when you want to go a bit faster and you just want to have less code to run. So here I have, the previous owner here and i have new owner which is here in parameter so it will it should be fine so let's try to compile this and here we should have errors and i think you knew why so here honorable trade not defined okay same same problem as before just be sure you go in the top of your module here and here we want to use demo so we can use it like this also honorable traits like this and here i will be able to have this declared, import, and now I have another error which says, okay, for the honorable trait owner is incompatible with honorable trait owner expected uh, contract address. Okay, so let's see, let's see what we have here. Check. Where is it? Okay, so here also I don't have something, so I will return it. So I have a contract address, contract address, and owner. Okay, so now the problem is that I have a function here, but I don't return anything. Okay, so let's say for the owner itself, we make self owner read, which is the value which is in the storage that we want to we want to return. Okay, so now okay, tech tech tech, demo actual course technet core address. Okay, here this is a typo, contract state. So you all have a contract state here, contract state here, and we should be better. Okay, so now we have something that compiles and we implement a new interface, which is transfer ownership and honor, and you can emit. Here, you can also choose exactly as David does here. Uh, here, You can choose to use the full enum qualification, you can, uh, but at the end, if the structure doesn't have the attribute, as the attribute, you can directly put the structure, which is a bit like, less code to write and easier to read, okay? So now we're good. We have the contract, we have the traits. Uh, now let's try to deploy it. So you should have Katana and Starcry installed. So to install Katana, just to be sure, because there is there, there were a great question about someone. So you just go in Dojo Engine. And here you can go in documentations. And documentation, you can have a, party, a part of Katana, which is here. And Katana binary is available with Dojo Up. So it means, you don't have so sorry it was my fault because i give the links on this page so perhaps people just follow that and i'm sorry you can yeah. use dojo so, yeah. so this was the concise first. yes thank you thank you so to install katana you just take this script here you run this script with dojo engine so perhaps i can put it on the on the chat here you take this one and once you have taken this one you just have to run dojo app. so i'm sorry the confusions came from my links and here it just done all the binaries and you're done and katana is here Hop, katana is available here okay so sorry for the for the one that built everything from scratch it was a link so here we have katana running and now we want to target katana so to target katana um we are using starcly i will give you a link here uh about starcly so to use starcly we have two files we have the account file and we have the key store file. I'll just put a little readme here for you guys. But the idea is just download everything that is here, clone the repo or take those two files because Starcly is using this. So if I go in the Starcly documentation, Starcly, when uh, we use the 101, every time we have to prepare uh, to use a key store, which is our key, which is encrypted, and we have to use an account, okay? So to go faster, just take the two files that are in this repo, which has already the account and the key store, and you have an environment file that you just have to source, just like this, it will export uh, the values for us, okay? So I will show you on my computer directly. Uh, 
So here I am in Starkly Katana. I have the account, I have the key, and here I also have the environment. So what I do is I source the environment file, which make available that the Starknet uh, RPC, for instance. So it's, it's now available in my shell. And then when I use Starkly, Starkly will, will directly take in account those variables. So I will give you an example. If I make a call and I make help, you will see that in the help, I have environment, stocknet, RPC, and I have the variable already set, okay? So just take those files, uh, source the environment, and then you will be able to use Starkly with, with Katana, okay? That, that, the, that, that the thing you need. So now what I will do is I will do in the demonstration, and we will start to declare, deploy, and use the contract. So, uh, David, do you want me to make a brief stop here, or we can go forward? No, let's let's go for it. Let's go. Okay. So remember that we have seen in the presentation. First, we have to declare, and then we have to deploy. So remember that when we write code, we have a class hash. So in Starkly, there is a class hash function. So when I compile something, it's going target dev, and here you see the demo. I have the demo, all the contract that I have compiled before. So let's let's remove everything in target and let's compile again okay we will compile again like if you will see so when i go start build it will send in parknet dev i have a sierra.json and i have an artifact starknet artifact this one will be used with uh, is used with forge that you would see with uh, robert and this one we can use it directly because this is what we, we will send okay and that will be compiled so remember we write caro we compile into sierra and then it's uh, interpreted as uh, caro assembly code so let's take Starkly, class hash, and then I will give the target dev demo ownable, okay? So here you can see that Starkly is giving me the class hash of my code. So if I go in my code and I just change something else, let's say, let's say in the constructor, what we will send, mm, let's say, where is it? Yes, let's say we will initialize the data, uh, self dot, dot data dot write and we will just initialize to one for instance okay so here i just change one line of code and if i compile again and then i use starkly to check the class hash the class hash is totally different so just remember it every change to your contract will make the class hash change it okay so now we have this we can use the starkly declare okay starkly declare is expecting a file and then is expecting an account to work because we have to pay fees to declare because we will modify the state and we have to pass the RPC. As I already exported the variables, you can see that if I check the help, Starkly is already detecting the variables. You can see Starknet RPC is here, Starknet key store is here, uh, and I have the variables already set. Okay. I will just make a quick change like this. I will be sure it will work. So what I will do is I will go in Starkly here. And I will just change the uh, environment files for the path on my computer. So it's like like this, uh, slash home in Starkly Katana. So I, I recommend also for you that you you just put um, full path. It will be better like this. You can navigate on your computer and Starkly will still use uh, the correct path, OK? So this should be fine. We source it like this. We are sure that we have the variable that is ex that is exported correctly, and this should be a valid pass, which is valid, which is not. Um, sorry, yes, it's, it's seven eight. Sorry, up seven eight seven eight. Okay, echo, and just be sure that it's a valid pass. Okay. Um, sorry for that. Okay, sorry for the little stuff, so just be sure you have your path <laughs> Okay. Echo. Now we should be fine. Okay. So now I have the files. I go back in my projects. And here I will go start line, declare, and then I have to pass the file, which is the Sierra code, okay? Demo enable Sierra. 
So when I will declare, Starcry will ask me the password. The password for this file is one, two, three, four for everybody. This is the same file for everybody. And here I have the declaration, okay, which is executing on Katana. Katana to launch it, I just have to make Katana and here it should work. And as you will see, Katana will output you uh, all the accounts that are by default and we are using the first account, okay? So here we are, here it declared. So let's see why, okay. Okay, let's let's see one again what's it's happening here. Uh, okay. Take, take, take. Mm. So it's not different. Mm. Mm. Uh, sorry, David, because I made it yesterday. Let's see why. Sorry, I wasn't Let's paying attention. What? I was here answering. No, 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 questions. no problem. No problem. No problem. I, I'm just trying to see why, why I don't have it because I had it yesterday. So I have to check why. I have to check why. Sorry, guys, for that. Mm. Um, I'm sorry. I'm not sure why it's not. Why it's not good? Let's see. Because I had it yesterday. Why? Um, I'm very sorry for that. I wasn't expecting that account. Account, it's fine. Um, yeah. Carl um, says that we want said Carl one. The what? Sorry. Carlos, if you know the question, you can. Mm, I'm just. Mic. I'm just. Yeah. Mm, I don't know what. Simon says, try compiler version 2.1.0. Yes, I think it's this one. That's a nice thing. 2.1.0. Yes, I have tried it. But I still have contract error. Mm, but I made it. Mm. Okay, here we are. I made it yesterday. What's the difference? I just made a new Dojo app, which should not change. Um, I'm embarrassed. Very sorry for that. Mm. What if we, time. I mean, if, you, if you're stuck right now, why don't we just switch to deploy to the testnet? And then yeah, we yeah. Can um, come back to debug this, yeah. this one. Um, just very, yes, I think we will have to do it. But I am a bit frustrated because. Yeah, okay, just be sure we have the last one, yes. I wasn't paying attention, what is the issue? Did yeah. you cannot declare the smart contract? No, that? I can yes, exactly, so that's weird. Mm -hmm. But I, I knew there is changes, but I'm not sure why, Why? but yes, no, I'm a bit frustrated here, but because it's very interesting to see the gas usage, et cetera, in Katana, so. If, if so I'm yes, saying so, that there was an issue yeah. reported about Starly and Katana yesterday on Telegram, so yeah, and something that broke just recently. Yes. So let's, let's fine. live try. coding, live coding yeah. is, is, is yeah, I'm this. Sorry. So. <laughs> I'm sorry for that, guys. Uh, I would just make something. Uh, I would just, because yesterday I tried it, but I think I tried it on my looking current version of Katana, which was on the main. Yes, so I will make the demo with this version. So I'm sorry if you will not be able to, but yes, there is an issue and thank you guys for reporting. I think the nightly build is not done yet. So the modification has anything. So, okay. So let's 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 go again just to, uh, and I'm very sorry for the inconvenience here. So let's go again and make Starkey declare then. Starkey declare is just to upload the code into the blockchain. So we are seeing that when we declare, we have the class hash. And then we have also the Chasm class hash, which is uh, the one which is in Chasm, but we have those two, the CRI one and the, and the Chasm one. And then we have the transaction, and then we have the new class, which is now declared, okay? So it means now the, the, the blockchain is containing it, in that case it's Captana. And then you can see here the transaction is, is received. So one was asking about the gas cost, for instance, for uh, a declaring. 
So here with Katana, we have the L1 gas that is you can customize, etc., uh, based on what you will use uh, in your code. But also you have exactly how exactly how, what your transaction is consuming, how many steps, which is the Kero steps or instru instruction that are executing uh, the the different types of computation which is done. So it's it's interesting to have it because usually you want to minimize the steps just to be sure you have less gas uh, to pay. Okay, so. Here we have the contract declared. So once it's declared, we know that this class hash is declared. So now what we can do is a deploy. And to deploy a contract, you have to pass which class hash because you don't have to send code anymore. The code is already declared on the blockchain, okay? So it means now I just have to deploy using the class hash that is registered. So let's let's give it a try. So if it's, I go starkly deploy and I pass a class hash that is not existing, I have a contract error that is saying, oh, okay, the class hash is not declared. Okay, that's fine. So now we will have to pass the correct class hash. And now I will make the deploy once again. And now I have another contract error. Why? Because you remember that when we deploy, we call the constructor. And if we have some arguments in the constructor and we don't pass them, the constructor will fail. So here, this is what it says. It says execution fail. And you will see the same errors in, in the in the test net. So it's a execution fail, fail to deserialize parameter one. So if we go back in our code uh, and we close this problem here. So if we go back in our code and we go back in our constructor, we have a parameter here. So it says, okay, the parameter one of the constructor, I am not able to deserialize it because you didn't pass it. So let's try again. And then we will try to pass a value. So remember, any value you pass by default is a felt. Okay, so let's pass um, one, for instance. And here, the compiler uh, will recognize in, in the stock net that, okay, I receive an argument, I put the argument, and now I can I can deploy. Okay, so now the deployment is okay. But we pass a random value, and the value we passed is not a contract address. You remember that here, we are expecting who is the first owner of this one. So let's say we want to be the owner. So if you take the, the files that, uh, uh, that are here, in Katana account, we have the public key, but we have also the address of the account. So let's take the address of the account to say, okay, I want to be the owner of the contract. So let's try to deploy another instance. So each time you deploy, it will deploy a new instance of your contract, okay? So it means if you are in, in working in StockNet, if you want to reuse the same contract, you will have to use another logic that we will, I think, not have the time, but perhaps Robert will cover it or we will see. So remember that you declare once, and if you don't change the code, any deploy you do will be another instance. Another instance means a new storage. Okay, so just be just be aware of that. So here I am doing starkly deploy. I give the class hash, and now I will pass my address, which is the account I am using now in Katana. And here, this is deploying a new one. You see, contract deploy 027. And if I go in the last one, the contract was deployed in 0336. So it's it's a totally different instance. So it means if I talk to this one, I will have the old value. So let's try it. So let's try it to, to call value. So remember, when we want to interact with a contract, we can make calls, which are totally free. And it's possible only if the function is a view. Remember, to have a view, we have to take the snapshot here of the contract state. So get data is a view and owner is a view. So let's let's try to call owner. So starkly call, it's a call, it's free. Then I have to pass the address of the contract. So let's pass the address of the contract here. And then I have to give the name of the method that I want to call, owner. And in the case of owner, I don't have any arguments, okay? I just have the contract state. This one, we don't have to pass it. So as I don't have any more arguments, I can just directly hit enter and it will return something. You see here, I have the felt value, which was one. You remember the first one I did, I put one just to show the serialization. But now if I take the second address, let's take the second address up here. And here I have my address, which I call when I make the deploy the second time, okay? So here, the great point to remember is serialization. When you call a contract, you have to know the arguments. And like this, you are able to pass the argument when you call or et cetera. So now let's try something. Uh, what if I want to call 
uh, 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 method, you know, uh, uh, an external. So let's try to call set data and we will try to pass a new value. So here, if I get set data, and here I have to pass a field. So let's let's pass a field, which is one, two, three. And here I have a contract error. So you will not be able to call something that is a, uh, uh, an external. So how do we call external, actually? Well, we make an invoke transaction. So starkly invoke, same thing. I have to pass the address of the contract, then the method, the function that I want to call, and then the values. And this will cause gas. So for instance, if I do this and I just forget to pass the arguments, I have the same error. You can see here, custom hint error, execution fail, reason, fail to deserialize, deserialize parameter one, because here I have one parameter here in the, the new value. So let's pass a value now, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. And now I pass it and now I have a transaction. So if we go in Katana here, we have transaction pool. I receive a transaction, which is exactly the same hash that we have here, you see, hash, hash. And then we have the resources. The, the most important one is that you see the gas is evolving because depending on what you are doing, the computation of the state diff will be different. So it means you will have a, a settlement which will be different. So the, 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 the cost will change. And the most important part is the steps. And also, well, run checks and Pedersen are more uh, advanced stuff of payroll, but the idea is the steps. So optimizing the gas, just be sure that you optimize the steps that you are, you are doing, okay? So here I have set the data. So let's try to make a call this time to get the data, okay? So get data is not taking any, 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 anything. So here I am getting the data. It is an hexadecimal, which is one, two, three, four. We can try again just to move something like two, five, five. 255 will be FF in hexadecimal. So now if I make the call, I will have FF here, which is 255, okay? So here you see, I am just interacting with the contract, sending transactions when I want to modify and making a call when I just want to read. And remember using the name of the method and then the arguments that depend on what you have in your method. So now what we can do to show you some examples is like, Let's say that uh, we want to change the ownership of the contract because right now we should have the owner, uh, which we called before. So Starkly, uh, if I make uh, a call, Starkly call, let's take the owner. So if I take the owner, this is my address here. And here we can just change the owner. So we will transfer ownership, okay? And if, for instance, I make a mistake on the name of the functions, then you will see that entry point not found. If you have this error, you are just writing a bad name of the of the functions, which is called selector. So here it didn't find the selector, which is a function. So now let's try to take a, another Katana account. Okay, so to take an, uh, oh, we can make a random address. So let's transfer ownership and we will give it to the address one, two, three, four, five, which is not a valid address, but uh, there is no contract here, but we will just change the ownership. Okay, so if I change the ownership, uh, this is not a call, so I have to make an inbox and here i will change the ownership so if i call back the owner you see that now it's the new owner okay so now if i try again to change i am not the owner anymore so it means i should be denied by the by by caro so if i try to transfer ownership and i want to transfer it back to me for instance um or let's say oh, let's say this Get an account. So let's try to go back to our address here. And here, as you will see, I have a contract error this time. And if I go back in the errors, so what we see here in Katana, you will see exactly the same thing in the in the test net or in the main net in the explorer, but here it's just more quicker and you, we don't pay anything to test. So here we can see, got an exception while it's exec executing a field, execution fail, caller is not the owner, the owner. And if we go back in our code, this is exactly the error, the error that we, we have put here. Caller is not the owner, okay? So remember in Cairo, we have the short strings for now. So it means you are limited to 31 character and you have to use a single quote, okay? So, but the idea is this one, that you can see here, the execution is reverted and you have exactly the message error that you put in the asset. 
which is here. So we can make a quick post for question if you want, because I think we covered call, inbox, and interaction with the contract. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, we've been answering questions, but I think there's some interesting questions overall. Like, for example, could you explain more the difference between Katana and a stagnant foundry? Yes. Okay. Um, so, in Stagnet, as we have seen here, uh, okay, let's go back here. Okay, in Stagnet, in order to have contract deploy, etc., who is responsible of this is a sequencer. So it means the sequencer will have the Stagnet states, will have all the contracts in memory, and 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 when you are in the database locally. So when you when you declare something, you are adding data into the sequencer. When you deploy something, you are also adding data uh, to the states. And the sequencer is the one that is running this. So a sequencer is just a piece of code that is taking transaction and modifying the state, executing the contract logic. Katana is a sequencer, like you just run it and you can do exactly the same thing that you do on the testnet or, or, or mainnet. Testnet and mainnet is no more than another sequencer that is in Israel, I think, which is for now centralized. The, it will be decentralized in the future, but the idea is this is exactly the same thing. It's a piece of code that accepts transaction and runs transaction. So Katana is a sequencer. It means you can spin it up. And for instance, if I want to reset all the state, I just have to kill Katana, start again Katana, and I start something fresh. For instance, here, if I try to invoke again, it will say, oh, you know what? I don't find the contract. Contract is not deployed because I just resetted everything. So Katana. Take it as a sequencer. You send transaction. You you can make calls, but you cannot test uh, something. You you just uh, you use it like a, a playground. Okay, let's say like the playground. Foundry, Starknet Foundry is a testing framework, which means Starknet Foundry inside is like a sequencer because it has the same piece of code, but it's a bit modified to allow you to make some tests because it means you can use the what they call cheat codes. It means oh. I want to simulate. I have something at this address. Oh, I want to 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 mock uh, a state. Or oh, this is Starknet Foundry. It's like a testing framework. Katana is a sequencer. With Katana, you cannot. Yeah, they they will put uh, some stuff to to make some modifications. But the idea is, you spin it up and you try to use it as if it was testnet. It's faster, easier to debug, and you don't have to wait or pay uh, even if it's quarterly. So. Sequencer for the for development and a testing framework, I would say. Yeah, I think to to also add to that, uh, so a stagnant foundry uses Blockify under the hood, right? But let's say Blockify is just one module of what a sequencer needs to be called a sequencer. Is is the state management, right? So Katana goes one step further. Not only manages state, but also exposes the RPC web server, so you can interact that through an API calls. Uh, in the case of a standard foundry, the interaction, the interaction between the test framework and they say this blockifier, this module of a sequencer, is done directly as Rust Rust libraries, right? So it's much more performance. You don't have to use an, an API or RPC to interact with that. So it all happens under the hood. You don't you don't really notice it. Um, this other question for Falila: If you want to invoke a function using another address, how do you go about it? I mean. How will you specify it in the terminal? I guess in the case of a star line. Pierre, maybe you lost your audio. No, it's just because I muted it when oh, you were speaking. Okay. <laughs> uh, so in, in the case of star line, the address of the contract, the first argument after star line invoke, star line co. So here, invoke, this is uh, the, the, the address of the contract. This is the address of the contract, this one here. So if I want to make a call, it's the same thing. So I don't know if it was a question, but this is the first parameter you get. Starkly will soon have an address book. So it means when you will deploy. So for instance, if I go starkly deploy, I pass a class hash, I will be able to make something like this, save my contract, for instance. And then this may, like you will be able to do something like this, call my contract. And you will don't have to bother mm -hmm. uh, copying and remembering it. But for now, it's not uh, live. But the idea is it will be live up to soon. So the idea is using it like that. So yes, for now, you have to copy paste the hexadecimal value of your address, and you have to pass it explicitly. OK, no, no more questions for now. So we can no continue. more questions. So let's try. So 
I think before the testnet, it will be nice to make a dispatcher example just to see how we can call different contracts. So let's say we will try to uh, to deploy um, other contracts. Okay, so I don't know what can be the best idea to go faster. Um, what can be? What can be? Well, let's let's try to 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 change to declare two contracts. Okay, so. What we want to do is we want to be able to call another contract. So let's say we will have, up, let's say we will make, a, um, uh, yes, we, we will do it here. So here, when I have an interface, you remember that an interface with, will auto-generate uh, dispatchers, which means uh, if we go back in the presentation in this part here of dispatchers, so when I have an interface, the dispatcher trait and the dispatcher and library dispatcher are already defined for me. So it means I don't have to write them. So here, let's say our contract, when we, when we, go, when, when we do a, a, a get data, what we want to do is we want to call uh, another contract, okay? So let's change uh, get data. And here we will have other contracts and it will be a contract address, okay? So here, so remember what we said with the interfaces, if I try to compile this, it will complain. While it will complain, it will say, oh, you know what? The number of parameters of get data is not compatible with the interface. So it means I am trying to change code on the fly, but as I am in the interface, it has this safety for me that, oh, you can do this if you don't declare it here. So here I have to say, oh, you know what? I changed my mind. Gate data will be with another contract address, okay? And now, if I compile this, we should uh, contract address, contract address. Yes, if I spell it correctly, it will be better. Contract address. And now, you know, I say now. Um, what am I missing? Oh yes, I'm just putting too much commas here. And now I have something that compiles. So it means, remember that interfaces are a kind of safety also. So try to use it if you can. So now I have it. So the I data, A data, which is here, uh, I have the trait already generated, but I have to import it. So it's always called the same one. It's I data, which is the name of my uh, interface, and then it's dispatcher traits and E data dispatchers. Okay, we always have this one, and we also have the library dispatcher. But let's focus on this one for now. So the idea here is like I already have the traits de declared by the, the attributes and I can just uh, import them. So you see here, if I just compile, it recognizes that those two uh, structures are actually existing in the trait. So now if I go back here, I have to say, okay, I want to call it. So to instantiate a dispatcher, you just have to do something like this. You have to put which dispatcher you want to use. So it's a data dispatchers, okay? And then you have to give what is the address of this contract. So in my case, you see, it's not called contract address. So I have to, um, I have to tell it like explicitly how I want to initialize it. And once I have the dispatcher, I can, I can make the call or the inbox. I, I can use any function, okay? But remember with the dispatcher, I will call the contract with his home storage. So let's take an example. So now I will make, okay, I will get the owner of the data let's get the data of this contract so let data it's equal to dispatcher and then i can call the function so in my interface i have set data get data so i can use any other two functions so let's say get data okay and then well i think it will be an infinite loop yes this is not the best example sorry this is not the best example mm, sorry Sorry, we will do it on the set data. No, it will loop also. Yeah, I, I will just show you the, the writing, but it is not a good example because it could make a, an infinite loop, which is not that good. It will fail. So get data, and here uh, I don't have to push. I have to pass something with all the contracts. But let's make let's make another function. Let's make another function like this. Let's make another function. Um, uh, another function, and then we take another contract. Okay. So here, once again, I have to take this one. I have to put it in my implementation up here. 
this. We will remove this from here. We will remove this from here. And we will put it here. So here, let's take this one. We have another function. And when we call the other function, it will take a dispatcher and then it will uh, get the data of uh, another contract, for instance, okay, of this contract. So get data oh, like this. And then I want to return the data, for instance, like this. Okay. Like this. Okay, so now we have another function, and this other function is taking another contract address as parameter. And what it does is it uses a dispatcher. Using the dispatcher, it get the get the data of the other contract, and it returns the data of the other contract. Okay, so as we use a dispatcher, it will use the storage of the contract, which is the other contract address. It will not use my storage, and we will see we will see this in a minute. So let's try to build this. It's fine. So now let's try to declare. So I just kill Katana like this. I am in a completely new state. And now we will deploy everything. So let's make a start key deploy, a declare. You have to declare every time you, you recompile, okay? Because if your class has these changes, you have to redeclare your contract, okay? So target, dev, demo enable, and I just declaring on the chain. Now it's declared, I have the class hash. With this class hash, I can now deploy. So I can make startly deploy. I will use the class hash. And then I have to pass the argument, you remember, in the in the in the constructor. So I have to pass it, uh, I have to pass my address just to be sure I can make the, the call if I have a if I am an owner. So let's take this one. Check here. Here, one, two, three, four, is equal. So we have the first contract at the address. 0x16. So let's take this one here. Uh, up, let's put it here. Here. So this is a contract one. Okay. Contract one. We have here. And then, then we just make exactly the same comment, the same owner. There is no problem. And we will deploy it again. And here we have another contract. Okay. So I have two contracts deployed the first one and the second one. Okay. So now we will set the data of the first one. Okay, so let's take the first one and we'll make starkly. Remember, if we want to change, it's an invoke, if we want to, 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 to use an external function. So we will use the, 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 the first contract here, and then we will invoke set data and we will put one for the contract one. Okay, so here, if I now use the call, so get data, so you see, I change invoking call and I change the function name here. If I get, I have one, which is which is my value here. And now let's take the second contract. So for the question we had, yes, for now it's a bit like handy stuff, uh, manual stuff to change the value. And let's put this one on 999, okay? So now if I do once again, instead of an invoke, I do a call in the same contract and I get the data, I will have 3A7, which is 999, okay? So now I have my two contracts. And we have seen that we have a function, which is other function. And this function, when we call it on one contract, it will call the other contract we pass in arguments just to get the data, and it will return the data of the new contract, of the other contract, okay? So let's try it. So now if I do a starkly call, because you see that this is a view function, because I'm not taking the, the reference, I'm just taking a snapshot. So if I call the contract one, and now I will call the other thing. First, I have to pass an argument. If I go here, I have a contract error because I have a problem that deserialization the, the, the data. But now if I pull a call and I just take the address of the second contract, here you see, I am calling the first one, which the value is one, but I am saying, okay, call with the dispatcher, the other one. And here you can see, this is 3e7, which is the value of the other contract. Okay, so I think we have time just to check the, 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 the dispatcher library. So let's go in the care book. In the care book, we can go in dispatchers and here, and you will see in dispatchers, we have the contract dispatcher, which is using the storage of the target contract. And you have the library dispatcher, which is uh, the one calling 
your storage, but you call another function from another storage. So normally when you have different contracts, you want to use different functions for, for all, all the contracts. So here, what we see that is the tray is the same, but it's library dispatcher instead of dispatcher. So if I go here and I try to import e data library dispatcher, it should not complain. Like start bill, it doesn't complain. And now what we will try to do is say, okay, you know what? I don't want you to use the address, the, the storage of the other contract. I want you to use my storage. So let's see if we can do something like this. Library dispatcher. So scale build, contract address. Oh, library dispatcher is using, oh yes. Okay, so you see here the mistake I made is the library dispatcher is calling a code. It's not calling a contract itself. It's just calling the code related to this. So it means you don't have to pass an address. You have to pass the class hash. Because you remember um, when you declare something, you just put the class hash with the code on chain. So it means with a library dispatcher, you say, oh, you know what? I want to call a function. I don't want to call something. So it means the function that you will call, well, will just compute the values, but using your own storage. And here's a class hash. So this is a bit painful because you have to pass the class hash, you know, the value of the class hash. So I think we will not have the time to make it here because you remember every time you change the class, the, the, the code, the class hash changes. So you have to pass this kind of values as parameters directly. So here, for instance, if I want to call another one, I will have to make class hash. And here it's a class hash, which is also a type. And then I will pass the class hash here. Okay. And then I will be able to make the call. Uh, actually, we can we, we, we can try to do it just to, to add it now. Um, well, I think it's not that relevant at the end. Uh, what do you think, David? Because it's like 52. So I don't know if you want me to go perhaps more in test nets or... Uh, sure, I think we go over a couple of minutes. That's, that's fine. So I, I, I finish trying to do the dispatcher or yeah? Because the test net perhaps may be more interesting for people. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, because we have to cover the test net, right? We haven't done that yet. It's all Katana. But exactly, yes. So, so yes, the idea should be. Uh, so, let's take it again. Nice. So, what, what we have seen from now, you have seen that we, we wrote a contract. Uh, the testing will be next week. So, we wrote a contract. We are able to declare it. And once it's declared, we can deploy it. And you have seen that with Starcly and Katana, but Katana is just which sequencer you use, but we can directly use call invoke to work with it, okay? So with Starcly, you can check the documentation of Starcly to set up an account. I will just do it right now, just to show you how it works. But the idea is you will have to set up your account, but Starcly has, has a nice guide for this. But the idea is what we have did here, we just have to change the RPC URL and the account, and this will work exactly the same. So it means all the work you are doing locally with Katana, for instance, or when you will do the testing, but with Katana, exactly what you did here, you will do exactly the same on the testnet, which means you can go very fast locally, and then you just have to switch the URL and it will work for testnet. So let's try. So if I go back to, if I go back to my computer, in this here, I gave you two files, which is an account and a JSON key. Okay, uh, and then in my environment file, I have exported those ones. But now I just want to switch network. So what I will do is I will take this one and in my computer, I have some uh, accounts uh, normally. Tech. I have some accounts, you see, here I have Glim Bravo Step one for instance account. So I just have to change the routes for this and it should work directly uh, on the test net. Okay, so in, in Starcly, you can use the gateway, which is you don't have to have a node, etc., to work with. So this is what we will do here. But normally here, you if you use Alchemy or Infura, you will put the, the node RPC here. So, so let's just uh, remove this one, for instance. And here I will just go in uh, home, accounts, and it's accounts, and the accounts is in both of them. This one. I hope I remember my password of this one. <laughs> uh, and then I have a dot key store. So this is my file organization, but you can have any any organization that you want to, and it should be exactly the same one. Yeah. Here, key stores. So now 
what I will do is uh, when I am here, if I source this one, now the stocknet um, accounts will be the new one. So, and as I didn't put RPC, Starcry will directly try to reach the testnet with the gateway, okay? But please just take your own ones, URLs for the RPCs and it will be better. Um, so here, if I am in this terminal, I also have to, I also have to, to source it. So I source it. And now if I go here again, if I go starkly declare, so exactly the same thing, target, dev, demo, enable, and then I didn't find it. Tech tech. Why? Just do it. Uh, why not? Why Did not? you forget why to not? source the file or something? I did it, but uh, that's uh, that's a good call. Oh, I yeah. Okay. Let's see. Okay, I will try to make it directly like this. Account. So you can use it like directly also with Starcry uh, if you want, but uh, like with the arguments. Uh, account. Store. Store. Okay, so now I have my uh, password. And now, uh, I can have a, a message and I say, oh, you know what? The class is already declared uh, in testnet. Oh, yes, now I have to unset start to say you So now you see Starcry will say, oh, you know what? I didn't find any, any, any provider info, so I will just directly target the gateway on testnet. But soon the gateway will not be able to accept more transactions, so you will have to use your own uh, RPC, okay? So let's enter. And now you see Starcry is doing exactly the same thing as did on Katana, but it's doing it on the, on the testnet. So it means you just have to change the configuration files of, Star, of Starcry, and you can do exactly the same process that you did locally with Katana, which is nice for development because you can go very fast with Katana. You don't have to bother to have some uh, ease in Gorli, et cetera. And then you just have to go when you are a bit more confident about this. So now I can do exactly the same thing. So let's let's try to do a deploy. So I'm sorry, the the, um, the command line is a bit more rough just because I I, I didn't have the, um, the source file. I, I have to check why. So here I can make a declare, and now I can make a deploy. And if I take this one, and I paste it here. So same thing. If I try to deploy, sorry. I try to deploy it, deploy, I give this one. And now I have to put password, mismatch. And now it will try to deploy. And you see that I, 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 forget, the, I forget the arguments. And what we have is exactly the same reason, but Katana is already uh, this, uh, changing the string because you remember, in Starknet Cairo, we have short string. So if I parse a short string, it will say, oh, you know what? I cannot deserialize the parameter one, which Katana already gives you, uh, you know, decoded. So that I have to say, oh, okay, you know what? I, 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 I will use something else. And I put the parameter and I forget my password again. And now it will do exactly what I did on Katana on testnet. So now if I take this one and I go on Stark Scan, or if I go on Voyager, uh, you have two explorers, uh, Stock, Stock Scan and Voyager, 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 I don't know how to pronounce it. And now you just have to wait that your contract is indexed. And once it's indexed, indexed then you will be able to see it on the explorers. So uh, there is another advantage to work locally that everything is instant. And here I have to wait the testnet. But what I wanted to show you is the easy way to switch uh, just a network and you're fine. And sorry for the, <laughs> the bad stuff live, but that's all for me today. Thank you. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, thank you, Pierre. Let's see if there's some question. I think there was some question here that I was unresolved. Uh, I think Duran was asking, maybe it's a little unrelated, but can you have a legacy map that the value yes. is a custom struct instead of yes, just a regular? Can. Yes, yeah. definitely. So when you work with legacy map, the, um, so 
in Cairo, as I said, you have some traits. When you have a trait implemented, it means you have a behavior. So when we talk about storage, uh, sterilization, the trait is survey. When we talk about storage, is store. And when we talk about hashing, is hash. So it means any structure that you implement the hash functionality will be able to be in a hash map, a legacy map. Yes, 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 yes. So you, you can definitely. So then you always have to do it when your type is not like standard. But yes, it's definitely possible. Awesome. Uh, guys, you have uh, time to ask some questions. We have, have yes. five, ten more minutes. In mm -hmm. the meantime, Pierre, could you, could you summarize at a high level what, what you did in this live coding session today? Yes. So uh, today what we've seen is first, we have seen the basics of, of how uh, Cairo, we write contract in Cairo and what are the basics of anatomy of a contract. Then what we did in the live session is we took again all those stuff and we didn't make the events, but it will be also interesting to make the events. But so the idea is we write the contract from scratch where we started to see how it's organized. A contract is a module. We don't have to forget to import stuff. And then we seen the different parts, which are the storage, which is mandatory, the constructor, which is optional, but we can use it to initialize by use once. Then we have seen the interfaces, which are a way to well organize the code and the way we expose functions. And finally, we have seen that how we can interact with contracts, making some calls with the dispatcher. And this was about the contracts. And once it's written, we have seen that in Katana, which is a sequencer for development that is a, a working exactly how the testnet is working, for instance, how we can declare first to have the code of the contract being uploaded, then how we can deploy to have these different instances of the contract with the, every instance has its own storage. And then we have made some call to make some, to call some read functions or some views. And we have made some inbox, which caused gas to modify the states points the external functions okay well thank you very much that was an, an awesome session i also learned a lot just especially from katana i mean just before hopefully you guys also learn uh carlos has a question i have always been curious on what is legacy about legacy maps are they going to be replaced by something else will they be safe to use them in the long term that's a great question um Actually, I think for now it's here for, yes, for historical reasons, because before we didn't have a dictionary, like dictionary structure, but now Cairo has a felt dictionary, which is, I think, uh, also something interesting. So I don't have the answer of if you have to stop using it or if you, are, you, can, keep, you can keep it for now. I mean, it will not be deprecated soon, but uh, just depending your data, just try to take a look at the felt dictionary, which is also interesting to use. So I didn't use it a lot myself, but you have a dig.caro that you can use directly, which is a felt, and we can try to, to play with it. But for now, I mean, legacy map is fine. It's fine. It's yeah, fine. I, I think the reason that we don't use dictionaries as well right now is performance, because like, dictionaries have to be awesome. squashed. Uh, yes. and, and we want to have something closer to just a regular hash map. Exactly. But yeah, eventually it's going to be something closer to a dictionary with, with the performance that we want from, from a hash map. Yes. That's but for sure, point. compatibility will remain there to not make obsolete all smart contracts, but you have the option to use a new structure for your storage. Exactly. And here, just to show you that I am in the compiler code, and what I said about the hash trait, you see, you have a trait, hash state trait, and then the legacy map is also a trait that we use in the storage. So it means as you've seen that the legacy map is taking any type that is implementing the hash trait. Okay, so it means if you're able to implement the hash trait of your on your structure, it will be able to store to be stored here. Perfect. So so thank you very much, Pierre. Let's let's close the session now because we're over mm -hmm. time. But I appreciate all of you staying, your questions, your time, Pierre, preparing this. Uh, uh, I'm going to send an email later today with the recording, with the slides. Pierre, if you have a repository with the final version of the code, we can send that as well. And we also some homework. Uh, I'm going to give you a chance to try Node Guardians. It's an awesome way to keep honing your skills in the smart content. You use all this new information that Pierre shared today. Uh, so thank you very much. I'll see you all uh, next week. Have a good one. Thank you, guys. Bye. Have a good day.